from Washington, D.C., this is Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Hannah Zuberi on this lovely Eid day. Team Muslim Network TV wishes all our Muslim brothers and sisters a very happy Eid al-Adha. Today, we're bringing the best reports and analysis that we have done. Let's start with our best reports. The mosque's architecture and style can vary greatly from one country to another. Nevertheless, the main features of a mosque appear similar all over the world. And a minaret is almost always there, although not required in Islam. The word minaret is derived from the Arabic word manara, which means beacon. It is a tall, slender tower attached to a mosque or on the top of a mosque. At the top, it normally has one or more balconies or galleries. These balconies were used for a person to call adhan form, or a call for prayer. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Minarets take many different forms. Here is the famous spiral minaret of the Samara. Tall, pencil-like Ottoman Turkish minarets are all over Istanbul for people to see. The oldest minaret in Africa is in Tunisia. It was built between 724 and 727 AD and has a massive square form. This one is in Timbuktu next to a famous learning center of Mali, built in 1327. It is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Here is the one from East London, perhaps the largest mosque in the UK. This one is in Moscow, and this one in Chicago has a great history. These minarets are part of a mosque funded by boxing champion Muhammad Ali. It was managed by Jabir Muhammad, the one-time manager of the boxing champion. <music> Calling people to prayer or then was a part of Islam from Prophet Muhammad's time, God's peace and blessings be upon him. However, the minaret emerged as a part of a mosque architecture later on. Civilizations build upon each other, so a minaret resembles a church tower as well. Islamophobes, however, feel threatened by minarets. Muslims in the West have to go through a long process requiring them not to have a minaret. Often, a compromise is achieved by reducing its height, which sometimes does not make much aesthetic sense. Islamophobes in Switzerland started calling minarets missiles. Switzerland went as far as amending its own constitution to ban building minarets. This perhaps is the only constitution in the world dealing with a minaret. No such ban is placed on any other places of worship. Pakistan has 140 nuclear bombs, while India has 130 of those. God forbid if they ever use it. These bombs can destroy not only both countries, but destroy quite a bit of their neighborhood. The battle over rice, on the other hand, is much nicer. Not any rice, but Basmati rice, the king of rice. India is the world's largest rice exporter of Basmati rice. Pakistan is the only other exporter of this rice. This time, it is clear that India had started this war. 
India has applied for an exclusive trademark in Europe for basmati rice. That would grant India the sole ownership of the basmati title in the European Union. This will prohibit Pakistan from its exports. Pakistanis also believe their basmati rice is the real basmati. And the Indian basmati is number two. Isko hum 90% of our work is basmati rice. We purchase our farmers from basmati rice. Okay, so our farmers will be closed in this way. We can't do much more production. Indians want their basmati to be like champagne from France. Maybe they can settle for potatoes from Idaho. The world, however, may not have much of a problem, be it the basmati rice and the mango fights. It is far better than a real war between the two nuclear powers. Smart robots distribute holy water from the Zemzem well to pilgrims in a bid to avoid contact between workers and people amid COVID precautions ahead of the coming Hajj season at the holy site of Mecca. <laughs> Saudi Arabia says it will allow 60,000 residents vaccinated against COVID to perform this year's Hajj, but Muslims from abroad will be barred for a second year straight. There are two Eids that Muslims celebrate. The first is Eid al-Fitr, which comes after the month of Ramadan. The second is Eid al-Adha, which follows the completion of the annual Hajj pilgrimage. The day of Eid al-Adha falls on the 10th day of the final 12th month of the Islamic lunar calendar, Dhul Hijjah. The celebration of Eid al-Adha is to commemorate Prophet Ibrahim's devotion to Allah and his readiness to sacrifice his son Ismail. At the very point of sacrifice, Allah Almighty replaced Ismail with a ram, which was to be slaughtered in place of his son. This command from Allah was a test of Prophet Ibrahim's willingness and commitment to obey his Lord's command without question. In commemoration of this intervention, animals are sacrificed in the name of God. One third of their meat is consumed by the family, while the rest is distributed to the poor and needy. Sweets and gifts are given, especially for kids. Eid al-Adha will last four days. Thank you for watching our reports. Let's take a quick break, and after the break, we'll share the best analysis segments from last week. Give a little love yourself Cure your greed Purify your wealth Look around at where you live Look at all the good you have to give Give a little love yourself There's a hand somewhere to hold a mouth to feed There's so much that we can do For so many who are in need Give our time, give our wealth Give our love, give ourselves no Allah sees each and every hidden deed Give a little of yourself Cure your greed 
purify your wealth Look around and where you live Look at all the good you have to give Give a little love yourself Take a look at all the people everywhere Who give with open hands And hearts that do what's fair Can you see the blessings fall On believers one and all Who take the time to give And know it's right to care Give a little love yourself Cure your greed Purify your wealth Look around at where you live Look at all the good you have to give Give a little love yourself Give a little love yourself Cure your greed Purify your wealth Look around at where you live Look at all the good you have to give Give a little love yourself I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds, walk a mile in my shoes, walk a mile in my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize, and accuse, walk a mile in my shoes. Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. It's time for a people's vaccine. As many as 45 people have been killed in the Nelson Mandela's country, South Africa. It is the worst violence, media is saying, in South Africa since the end of apartheid. All highways in South Africa are shut down because of the protest, the people demanding the release of the former president, Zuma, who was detained because uh, for the contempt of the court, uh, all of this is happening while the country is in a strict lockdown because of the Delta variant of COVID, which came from India. But there is an Indian family, Gupta family, whose ties to President Zuma are the cause of the scandal on which he was being tried for the corruption. Our guest is from South Africa to explain what is going on on her street and around. Shanila Muhammad, welcome to Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum. Well, uh, thank you so much. Shanila Muhammad is executive director of Amnesty International South Africa, as well as a writer and a journalist. Please update us what is happening, what is the current situation? Well, uh, as you rightly said in your in, in your introduction, uh, you know we ever since uh, our former president Jacob Zuma has been facing a number of charges uh, that have been linked to corruption, and uh, you know he was uh, summoned to appear. Be before the uh, Zonda Commission, which has been set up to deal with the issues of state capture and corruption, and he refused to appear before the Zonda Commission. He was then instructed by the, the Constitutional Court to do so. He again refused to do so. And so he was cited for contempt of court and was sentenced to 15 months imprisonment. Now, following his imprisonment, of course, you know, many of his supporters, um, you know, were declaring that they were going to make the country and governable, that they were going to bring the country to its knees and its economy to its knees. And so what we've been seeing since Saturday uh, has been exactly that. We have been seeing uh, riots, protest action, um, you know, and most importantly, we've been seeing looting, uh, lawlessness and anarchy. Now, according to the South African Constitution, Section 17 of the Constitution, everyone has the right to protest, but only if it's done peacefully and without weapons. 
So what these people are doing falls entirely outside the Constitution and it's all, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of against the law. It's criminal and it's lawlessness. Uh, which city in South Africa are you right now? I'm in Johannesburg. So the two cities that the most badly affected or the two provinces, should I say, are, um, you know, Gauteng, which is where Johannesburg is, and KwaZulu-Natal, where um, Durban is. And Durban is actually uh, worse hit than uh, Johannesburg. But, uh, you know, we have seen a lot of damage in Johannesburg as well. So how are your cities safe? Is your community safe? Well, you know, unfortunately, we even before these riots, you know, so we've been, we live behind, uh, you know, high walls and uh, security estates because South Africa has a very high uh, crime rate. But, you know, with these particular riots, I think that uh, there's a lot of anxiety amongst, uh, you know, most of the people who live in this country because the riots are sporadic. You don't know where they're going to start. You don't know who's going to, uh, you know, uh, start them. They happen at any time. But I think, you know, the most the worst thing about these riots is that is the uh, the destruction of uh, infrastructure. Entire shopping malls have been shot down, have been burnt down. There's been, you know, as you rightly said, 45 people have lost their lives. And of course, you know, there's been looting and excessive looting. You know, entire shops have been stripped of everything, including, uh, you know, the, the hardware in the shops, the benches in the malls. And, you know, the worst thing is once the looting has taken place, then they destroy. Uh, so, you know, trucks are being burnt down, you know, cars are being burnt down, journalists are being attacked. So it's really quite a, uh, a difficult and horrible situation that we're facing in South Africa at the moment. Is Johannesburg, I mean, you have been living all your life there. Has it been this worse before? Well, you know, South Africa has has a history of protest action, and that stemmed from the apartheid era days when, uh, you know, the people took to the streets to fight against um, apartheid. And this has continued post-independence where, you know, South Africans will often take to the street if they are unhappy about service delivery or wages or something like that. So we are not, um, you know, protest is part of our existence here. But this level of violence we have not seen uh, you know, since independence, since 1994. And the level of looting, the level of criminality, uh, you know, has is, is something, is a new phenomenon uh, to South Africa. And, you know, again, the argument that is being put forward is that, um, you know, a lot of these people are poor and, uh, you know, are, are taking advantage of the situation. But, you know, as Amnesty International, our argument is that, um, you know, you cannot deal with, with poverty and in inequality by uh, resorting to criminality and lawlessness. We recognize that South Africa has got one of the highest inequality rates in the world and there's a lot of poverty in this country. But uh, lawlessness, looting, criminality is not the answer. So what we're seeing at the moment is opportunistic uh, uh, sort of criminality. And yes, it started off in the name of Jacob Zuma, but it has, uh, you know, emerged into something uh, which is just pure um, violence and criminality. But why people love former President Zuma so much that they are willing to risk their lives? Well, you know, it's it's uh, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer because you know, on the one hand, you would think that people would uh, be uh, upset with him because you know, he, as you were saying in the beginning, he has been accused of uh, engaging in uh, you know corrupt activities with an Indian family called the Guptas. The the uh, you know a multi million rand commission of inquiry has been set up um, to investigate this and billions and billions of rand has been lost uh, in this uh, so-called state capture between uh, the Zuma presidency and the Guptas. So you would expect that people would really dislike him. But it, a lot of his supporters are in KwaZulu-Natal, which is where he comes from. And, um, you know, so there is that support base that he has there. Uh, and, you know, it's really about, um, you know, the fact that one of their people is, uh, is in jail and, you know, it's an ethnic sort of of, uh, um, support base. Uh, 
Uh, but also, it's very easy to use poor people. It's very easy to instrumentalize poor people when you want something done. So, you know, many of the people that are involved in these in these uh, in this looting, we, we don't know whether they are actual supporters or whether they're just being used in order to give the impression that uh, you know there's a big following behind him. But he does have a support base. The support base is mostly in. KwaZulu Natal, and and I think it's all based on ethnicity. He is a Zulu, and the people of KwaZulu Natal are mostly Zulus. Now, tell us a little bit about uh, the court. I mean, wasn't he? It, I mean, are there? I mean, you being at the executive director of Amnesty International, do you think the process of the court has been fair towards him? I think that, you know, the one thing that South Africa has, which is uh, lauded around the world, is our um, very, very um, uh, admirable constitution and legal framework. And we, ha we have a very independent judiciary. And so, you know, what uh, the, the, the whole process that was followed that led us to President Zuma, former President Zuma being sentenced to 15 months, was really due process according to the legal uh, framework. So, you know, he was summoned, he was given ample opportunity to present his case, even before the Constitutional Court decided on, on what um, sanction they should give him for contempt. They reached out to him and they asked him, you know, what sanction he thought he should be getting. But he refused to cooperate at every level. And the Constitutional Court had no other choice but to uphold the rule of law and to sentence him uh, to imprisonment. Because the other thing was that he was extremely defiant and even the the Sunday before he was uh, you know he had to hand himself in you know he was very defiant he was very clear that he was not going to hand himself over so in order to uphold the rule of law there was no other choice but to imprison him because you know I think the Constitutional Court felt that he had been warned on a number of occasions and those warnings were not heeded and in this situation it would still have been the same thing he would have not bought that he would have, you know, ignored the courts and the justice system. And so they had to take back their power and they had to uh, dish out quite a severe penalty. Are these reports accurate, which say, say that uh, it was the president, Jacob Zuma, who himself established the court, which is investigating it. Is it correct? It's absolutely correct. So uh, the establishment of the uh, the um, uh, State Capture Commission of Inquiry was part of a recommendation that came out of a report by the former public protector uh, advocate Tuli Mandosela. And in her report, where she was investigating uh, reports of state capture and corruption, uh, she recommended to the president that a state capture inquiry be set up. And it was during the time of President Zuma that uh, advocate Madoncela handed over her report. And President Zuma then, as the, the president at the time, uh, gave the order for the establishment of the State Capture Commission and also appointed Justice uh, Raymond Zondo, um, who is now the acting Chief Justice, to actually head it. So it's very ironic that, you know, one of his arguments for not appearing before the Justice uh, the Zondo Commission is that he has uh, no faith in Justice uh, Zondo that he feels that Justice Zondo is biased, etc. When he, in fact, was the one who not only established the commission, but also appointed Justice Zondo to head the commission. Shanila Mohammed, uh, what are your thoughts about why there's so much focus on President Zuma, uh, while the Gupta family is the one who is accused of uh, multiple levels of corruptions? I don't think that it's just a focus on President Zuma. I think that uh, you know, if you uh, the state uh, the state capture commission has looked at every aspect and has talked to everyone. I mean, the the Guptas were subpoenaed, and as you know, we all know they are sitting in Dubai, and uh, you know they uh, they are not uh, coming to South Africa. So they have been subpoenaed. They have refused to come forward. However, South Africa has implemented a number of 
uh, legal activities to try to bring them back to South Africa, including the signing of an extradition treaty with the UAE. Uh, and, and it's hoped that, you know, we will be able to bring uh, the Guptas back. So it's not, um, it's not true that it's only a focus on President Zuma. The reason we're dealing with this right now is because President Zuma has, has refused to cooperate with the Zondo Commission, whereas all the other people who have been implicated, who have been accused, have appeared before the Zondo Commission. And that's why there appears to be a focus on Jacob Zuma, but actually it's because of his own actions. You know, you use the term about uh, this Indian family of Guptas as uh, capturing the state. What do you mean by capturing the state? So what we mean by state capture is that, uh, you know, they literally, uh, to some extent, were de facto running parts of the government while President Zuma was uh, the president. So, for example, you know, the evidence that was presented before the Zondo Commission was that, you know, they even decided which ministers were going to be given which portfolios. And they knew before the ministers and they would summon the ministers to their houses and inform them that they were going to be given these portfolios. Portfolios. So really, you know, it was the, you know, it, the state capture goes beyond mere corruption. It, it goes to the actual heart of taking over uh, functions of the state that, that really they had absolutely no right to do. And that door was opened for them by the, uh, by the Zuma government. And so when we talk about state capture, we're not, we're not, we're not only talking about corruption because corruption has been huge. You know, the, the tenders, the, the millions and billions of rand that they have stolen and money laundered, etc., through the, the, the South African government. But we're talking about something even worse. We're talking about a family that was literally, a family from India that was literally running major parts of the government during President Zuma's time. Why judicial system was not strong enough and independent enough? to took an action when President Zuma and Gupta family from India were collaborating uh, in running the government, a non-elected business party, a capitalist uh, trying to control a major nation. Well, because it wasn't blatant, it wasn't, you know, out there. It was being done behind the scenes. There were secret meetings that were being held at their homes. There was so a lot of this evidence has come to light during the Zondo Commission where people have now started. And, you know, the, the, the one thing to remember is that a lot of this was exposed by the media in South Africa. So the South African media has played a phenomenal role in exposing corruption. And, you know, and, and in fact, a lot of the journalists have also suffered threats and you know attacks on their on their character etc by many Zuma supporters but you know this was not being done in a in a in an overt way it was being done in a covert way uh, you know in the in the shadows and that is why you know it took so long um, and of course you know there were there were many President Zuma did not do this by himself and so there were many many people complicit people in his government people in local municipal municipalities who were complicit in all of this. And I think the State Capture Commission is now exposing all of these people. And, and, and so now we're beginning to piece together what is the real story. Uh, so, you know, during President Zuma's time, uh, a lot of it was hidden. So when a minister was appointed, the assumption was the minister was appointed by the president. It's only now that we're realizing that the hand that the Guptas had in all of this. Shanila Mohammed is the executive director of Amnesty International in South Africa. I hope you stay safe because the COVID we heard uh, is also rampaging uh, in South Africa at this moment. Thank you so much. And to be honest, you know, one of the things that these protest actions have actually done is they've brought a halt uh, to the vaccination program in a country that was already behind uh, when it came to vaccinations. And so this is another very concerning uh, situation for us. And so, you know, our hope is that uh, the army, along with the police, will bring the situation under control as soon as possible uh, and allow the healing and the, you know, the, the coming back together. South Africans are 
tough and you know we will uh, survive this but i i feel like you know COVID has added to the to the challenge and uh, our numbers are continuing to rise on a daily level you know uh, we're, we're having 200 300 deaths a day and so you know the situation needs to be brought under control and our vaccination program has to be allowed to continue thank you so much thank you so much walaikum salam Thank you once again. Today, we're very happy to be joined by Sheikh Hashim Ahmed, who is an American Islamic scholar, as well as a teacher at the Darul Falah Center in California. Sheikh Hashim, thank you so much for your valuable time today. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Jazakum Allah khair. Allah bless you all. Interestingly, Muslims who live in Saudi Arabia might have a chance to attend the Hajj pilgrimage again this year if, of course, they have been vaccinated. But this will, in fact, be the second year in a row that global Muslims such as ourselves and many around us are barred from making that journey uh, to Hajj or Umrah. What are the reactions of religious leaders or regular Muslims around you and perhaps yourself? What do you think about that? Yeah, well, we think it's very horrific and it's very, uh, very significant. At the same time, we have to, uh, you know, we uh, recognize the fact that everything that happens in this universe uh, is according to the, the, the master plan of the creator of the universe, because nothing is coincident. We don't believe that there's anything by coincidence. It's all by design and plan. And so this has a, you know, this all fits into the greater plan and it has its significance. At the same time, it also points to the fact that we are getting closer to the final chapter of this world. You know, these type of, of you know, very uh, nearly, you could say, unprecedented or very horrific type of events which are taking place. This is probably, you know, an indication um, among other things, the pandemic itself and the fact that we're the barring from Hajj, this is all indicating that we're getting close, you know, to more, you know, horrific events, which will, you know, uh, become a, a, in the, uh, you know, in, in uh, close to the to the day of, of, the, of the resurrection and then, and then the day of the, the final day of judgment. So we're getting close. And of course, we have to keep in mind that the, the, the day of judgment for each one of us is the day of our death, which we don't know when that's going to be. So we need to be prepared for that at any moment of our existence. So I'll give this all to Fiqh. Now, this will also, of course, be the second Eid al-Adha that people will experience during this pandemic. What are perhaps congregants looking forward to when it comes to Eid this year? And do you think perhaps that Eid al-Fatr has helped us learn any lessons along the way that you might be able to share with us? Well, of course, this year is not as severe as last year. Last year was like it was a new experience and it was, I don't know about other places, the places there's some of the places are still, you know, uh, observing lockdown. Uh, here in California, things have pretty much gone back to normal. Here in the Masjid Ars itself, we're back to normal. There's no social distancing. People wear masks. Um, but it's pretty much, you know, it's pretty much back to normal. However, you know, having been, you know, deprived of of a normal aid and, and the normal, you know, proceeding for Hajj, and a lot of people go for Hajj. I myself was supposed to, you know, take a group last year. I was supposed to take a group again this year. And, of course, that didn't happen. And so, you know, sometimes, uh, if not most of the time, if not all of the time, when we have, you know, a particular blessing of, of Allah, you know, that is continuous without interruption, we tend to take it for granted. Now, you know, we don't take these things for granted. At least, you know, I think most people are realizing that these are great blessings. We need to, you know, show our gratitude. And if, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the principle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if we show our gratitude, he increases us. And if we don't show gratitude, we show ingratitude, then we lose those blessings and we might be, you know, bereft. Um, so I think that's pretty much what people uh, are, are feeling, and they're very glad to be back in the masjids and you know celebrating Eid as 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 normal. This Eid al-Fitr also we celebrated normally in the masjid, and again, of course, Eid al-Adha will be celebrating naturally and normally again this year, inshallah. We wanted to ask you about the various lessons of sacrifice from Eid al-Adha and what people can perhaps learn about that, uh, and especially resonating from such a difficult pandemic year. Uh, what would you say? Okay, so we have to understand what is the whole concept behind that, you know, sacrifice. It's not just, you know, uh, we're just slaughtering animals and, and eating and having a celebration. There's a whole history behind that. And this is the, the you know, part of 
you know, part of the fifth pillar of Islam, which is Hajj. And it all relates and it's all connected to the very purpose of our existence, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَلِنْسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ He has not created us except to be a manifestation of his servitude and his obedience. And so to, you know, to drive home this or to, you know, bring this, this, this concept of obedience into our minds and hearts and, and, and bring it practically on the limbs of our body and, and all of our and all of our practices and, 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 and activities in life. So we have these ibadat, these acts of worship which train us to do so. Now the Hajj is very significant because it's it is a conglomeration of every type of worship and every type of sacrifice, by the way. And this sacrifice goes back to the time of Abraham. By the way, Hajj or this pilgrimage is not something that was instituted by Muhammad, peace be upon him. It was, it was instituted by the, the prophet Abraham on the instructions of God himself, of Allah himself. And so the Hajj, the pilgrimage that we perform these days, to this very day, it was originally performed by Abraham. And behind that is a huge succession of multiple sacrifices. Number one, he was ordered to leave Palestine, which is a beautiful place, and it's a beautiful climate, and his family and everything, you know, was, was, was all, you know, just beautifully, you know, uh, appropriate for him. And he's ordered by, by Allah to take his wife and his son, who is just a newborn son, suckling on the, on the, on the mother's breast, and take them to Makkah Mukarramah, take them to Makkah, in the middle of the Arabian desert where there's nothing, there's no one, there's there's no means of, of, of sustaining human life even. Leave them there at the order of God, at the order of Allah, and now proceed. So sacrifice, why? Because to prove that we are sincerely for our creator, we need to, to show that we're prepared to sever all of the connections with all of the creation for the sake of showing obedience to the creator. So this was a very severe test to the prophet Abraham. Now to, to take his, his wife and to take his child and, and leave them there in Mecca to establish. And what was the whole point? The whole point was to establish this concept of connection with the creator and establishing a, a, a center and that's what that that's why we we face there in our prayers and even in all of our acts of worship we try to face and point towards Mecca itself to the Kaaba and at that point Kaaba was not actually built and later on you know a series of of of, of sacrifices and ultimately after even that huge sacrifice of just leaving the, one's land and then leaving one's child and one's wife you know in a foreign place now a further and, and much more difficult, you know, order comes from the creator that now as your son has come to age. And by the way, as we probably know, Abraham was waiting, you know, almost to the age of 100 years of age for a progeny that's going to carry on his legacy. And now God says, OK, no, you're going to sacrifice this child. Allahu Akbar, you know, <laughs> can you imagine any of us, you know? So now he proceeds back to Mecca and now taking the advice or, or taking his son into confidence that, you know, God has told me that I have to sacrifice you to what do you say? The son says, do what you're told, O oh father. You know, so everybody's on, on the page. In other words, we are prepared to sacrifice our desires, our comforts, our whatever for the sake of the, the, uh, for the obedience of our creator who has put us into, into this, into, into his existence and, and sustains us. And so, Allah, does, Allah doesn't want to take away our children. He doesn't want us to, to, to slaughter our children. He wants to test us to see, is his love and his obedience foremost and the top priority in our lives? So when Abraham and his son have shown total submission to that, to that order, so God sent a, a sheep in lieu of that sacrifice saying, we don't need your, the blood of your son. Sacrifice this sheep and celebrate the fact that you have passed the test. And so that, that sacrifice that we do every year, which is also part of the Hajj, and also for every Muslim who has the capability to offer that sacrifice in memory of the fact that that is what our religion is all about, to establish our connection and our total subservience to the Creator and be ready to sacrifice. And if we do so, we should celebrate that he's 
not going to give us a burden that we can't bear. So remembering all of these things, you know, that's part of the of the of the uh, of, of the whole process of Eid. So it is a recognition of sacrifice at the t same time a celebration for the success of the trial of our ancestor Abraham and the success that we have been guided towards. You know that very religion and. His success, inshallah, will be ours and hopefully all of mankind's. Thank you so much for that beautiful insight. Uh, you mentioned a few points there that lead us to our next question, especially on this idea of sacrifice. And you also alluded to this in the beginning slightly that yourself, as well as so many other people that two years in a row now, uh, you're unable to actually attend the pilgrimage of Hajj. Now, going to Hajj or going to the Kaaba, you know, doing... Um, Umrah is something that is special to a lot of people, whether that person is born Muslim or whether they are reverts, so on and so forth. A lot of people are having this um, canceled hedge, this concept very hard hitting to them. Um, it does cause a lot of um, feelings of sadness or unhappiness amongst a lot of people that might have prepared all year or that might have been looking forward to go. If you could share any words of wisdom or lend any kind of strength to those individuals that might be, uh, be, hit, be hit hard by not being able to go to Hajj this year. Absolutely, yeah. Of, of course, that would. As I said, I myself, I was, you know, supposed to take two groups myself. Although I used to live in Mecca and I performed Hajj many times by the grace of Allah. But every Muslim, his heart is connected and he wants to go. And now he's prepared and he saved up his money. And some people they're saving the, the life savings, and it's a one time in a lifetime, you know, opportunity. So obviously, it's going to be a huge, you know, a, a huge, you know, sort of trauma. However, as we alluded earlier, you know, as Prophet Sallallahu just capsulized the, the whole concept so beautifully in saying, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be on him, said, it's a very amazing affair that every aspect of the life of a, of a mu'min, the person with iman, it is khair, it's good for them, you know. Whether it's good, bad, or otherwise, in asabat shakar fakana If he gets that, you know, if what happens is you know uh, favorable for him, it's something that goes along with his desires and you know his wants and his wishes, then he shows gratitude, and it's good for him. It's good for him in this world. It's good for him in the next world. He'll get reward for that. Not only getting what he wants, he'll get reward in the next world. And if, on the other hand, in asabat darra sabr fakana right? It's so, you know. If something happens that is not, you know, according to our desires, it goes against our desires, it's a trauma, it's a, it seems to be a catastrophe or a dilemma. So what happens is, is that we understand that, that, you know, this is also from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so we have to be patient. And not only that, whatever is happening, it's for our betterment. You know, Allah knows and we don't know, you know. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, perhaps you, you love a thing and it's not good for you. Perhaps you don't. You dislike a thing and it's better for you. And Allah knows and you do not. We don't know what's in our best interest. Like a small child, he doesn't realize candy is not good for your teeth. He doesn't realize staying up late at night is going to, you know, perhaps have an impact on my, on my, on my, you know, my life's career, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So similarly, like small children, we don't have the insight into what's in our best interest. So what's ever happening to us is in our best interest. Whether we can understand the, the wisdom behind it or not, we would have to, you know, have that that belief that Prophet has told us that, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also mentioned. Lastly, the glad tidings for those people who have, you know, have suffered some type of loss, and this is a huge loss. What do they do? They say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. To Allah, you know, we are for Allah and back to him we return. And so for those people, as the Quran mentions, they will have the special blessings and favors from them, from Allah, and a special mercy. And these are people who are rightly guided. So all we have to do in the face of that is, okay, Allah knows best. I accept it. And we are for Allah. And Allah is, you know, we are going to return. And so Allah is going to give us all of these blessings and rewards. So it's actually better for us, you know. And who knows what might have happened if we would have been for Hajj. You know, so everything that happens, we have to, you know, look at it from that perspective. It's better for us. We understand or we don't. May Allah give me and all of us the ability to actually have that kind of acceptance in mind and heart. Amin to mami. I mean, thank you so much for that wisdom. Today we're speaking with Sheikh Hashim Ahmed, who is an American Islamic scholar as well as a teacher at Darul Falah in California. Sheikh Hashim, in light of the second canceled Hajj this year, thank you so much for your time and your insight today. It's great being here. I love this, y'all.
back to the new studio. Thank you so much for watching Best of Muslim News. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night and Eid Mubarak.